I'm Jake and you're with me in this off-grid A-frame cabin way out in the Ozarks. So a lot of people have written comments asking about this uh, tongue and groove roof deck and specifically how are we insulating it. So this video will be about the roof assembly itself and obviously it's insulated on the outside so we'll talk about how that works. At the end I'll talk through uh, some thoughts on the moisture behavior uh, of the roof assembly as well as uh, a little brief tidbit about insulation thickness. I've got a separate video up already that talks a lot about the tongue and groove, uh, so if you haven't seen that, uh, check it out. Uh, but super briefly, this is 2x6 spruce. It's just nailed directly to the rafters. Uh, there are no purlins, there's no other structural uh, components to the building, right? It's, it's just these A's and uh, the 2x6 spruce. Um, because it slots together and because it nails down, it makes a really strong kind of structural plane. So together, the uh, A-frame A's and the tongue and groove makes for the building itself effectively. So that's the first layer, the tongue and groove, which we can get to here on the inside. So let's go outside and talk through what sits on top of this. All right, directly on top of the tongue and groove is this Tarco peel and stick uh, membrane. So this serves kind of three purposes, one of which is a moisture barrier. So the second purpose of it is as an air barrier. It keeps the conditioned uh, air inside the building and makes it so that we don't have to use a bunch of energy to recool or reheat uh, air that comes from the outside. That's not an obviously good thing. I'd like to make like a video about this at some point, but the short version of it is uh, these kind of 1990s building practices like passive houses uh, assume that you have power available pretty much at all times. If power goes out and you're not there to open up the windows, then if you've ever forgotten to plug in a refrigerator, you know what happens, right? It's kind of a, a mold disaster. And in an off-grid setting, obviously that happens all the time. So these two things kind of butt up against each other, where on the one hand, you want to be solar powered off grid, so you want to build really tight, energy efficient houses. On the other hand, you have really unreliable electricity, at least while you're building the cabin. Um, and uh, these kind of older building practices like passive houses don't really account for that. The third thing that this membrane does is kind of the obvious thing, it sheds water, right? So it's a backup to the steel roof that goes on top. Uh, if there's ever a leak in the, the rest of the roof assembly, then uh, this makes sure that that water gets shed uh, down and out rather than into the cabin. That had a huge upside building this in a DIY fashion, which is that once this membrane was on, the cabin is dry, right? You just put the tongue and groove up, you put the membrane on, and then you kind of have a dry uh, shelter. The downside of using the Tarco for that is that it's not UV resistant. So while the cabin was dry, we still had to make sure that we kept the Tarco covered so that it didn't get damaged by sunlight. So on top of the peel and stick membrane, we then have insulation. So these are a regular 4x8 EPS uh, panels. So in the winter, uh, hot air will try to make its way through these cracks and it can make patterns in your roof. And so because of that, two layers overlapping so we and, and each layer taped, right? Very briefly about the thickness of insulation. This is only three inches. If I remember correctly, that's like an R18 or something like that. It's kind of crazy that I'm talking about uh, three inches of insulation and passive houses in the same video. The short version of that is that you shouldn't do three inches of insulation. You should do whatever code requires or more if you want a more efficient house. The slightly longer version, if you'll indulge me, is that the modern recommendations for how much insulation you should put on in the US are generally derived from a uh, piece of software that the Department of Energy maintains called Energy Plus. My day job is as a software engineer and I have the suspicion that the numbers that are being recommended by the HVAC industry 
don't take into account the complete collapse in cost of solar panels in the past decade. And so I modified Energy Plus to, you know, instead of just running one simulation, it runs hundreds of thousands uh, and tries different combinations of insulation thicknesses, battery bank sizes, and uh, number of solar panels for this specific location. And what the simulation ultimately came back with was saying that, well, these EPS panels are really expensive and the solar panels are really cheap. And so the software recommended two inches of EPS and then a, a significant amount of solar panels. Um, and so I've added an additional inch uh, that also makes it a helpful three inches, which lines up with the two bytes. Um, and so effectively, this is an experiment to see if that pans out. So because of that, you shouldn't take this as a recommendation as something to try, but more of as a kind of crazy experiment and come back maybe in a couple of years. And I'll try to remember to put up a video about uh, how this all panned out. On top of the insulation, there's then this cross batten pattern of two by fours. There's lots of different ways of approaching what you do on top of the rigid foam insulation. What they all have in common is that you generally have really long screws like these. So these are long enough to go uh, just through the vertical battens, uh, through all of the insulation, and then bite down on the tongue and groove roof. So different ways of approaching this would be just uh, putting uh, plywood on top. That's, I think, the most common if you're building uh, a flatter roof, because then you could just walk on the plywood. This roof is so steep, it's a 24-12 pitch, that that just didn't feel feasible. So I knew I wanted to use battens. And then you, you kind of have a couple of different options. Uh, one of them is to do vertical, the other is to do horizontal. If you watch Matt, Matt Reisinger's videos, uh, he does it diagonally. Um, uh, and then there's uh, this option where you go uh, crosswise, right? So you have one layer vertically uh, and one layer horizontally. So all these methods then end up uh, serving the same purpose in terms of uh, holding down the insulation and providing somewhere to attach the roof. So what differs then is um, partially in how they allow airflow. So if you use you use just vertical battens like these then the roof that goes on top ends up having air flowing vertically underneath it right so as the air heats up it's going to want to move upwards and it's got a nice uh, channel that just brings it up to the top where it can ventilate out so that's really nice because it means um, it means you have lots of airflow to keep moisture levels down if you have a leak it's less likely that it's going to do any significant damage uh, the downside of that is that these vertical battens don't help very much for attaching a roof, right? The steel roof, at least this type of steel, uh, at, at the least it needs horizontal, uh, horizontal boards to, to attach to uh, every two feet. So then you have horizontal battens like these, uh, and obviously they're perfect then for attaching something like a steel roof. You just put them in every uh, two feet and screw the roof to them, but of course the airflow here is not as good, right? So air is gonna to wanna to move upwards, not along uh, the sides. I think that's why Matt Reisinger likes to go option three, which is effectively to go half seas, right? So you put the battens diagonally. So as it moves diagonally, you get some horizontal span to uh, hold up steel panels, but because it also moves upwards, you have this opportunity for air uh, to kind of naturally follow the heat gradient up the roof and, and give you ventilation. The more I looked at it, the more it seemed like that's something that works really well if the fasteners on the roof are not exposed. So if you have something like a standing seam roof or a hidden fastener roof, then it doesn't really matter where this diagonal batten comes through as long as it's at you know the right spacing. Uh, you just set the screws and uh, go about your business. But in this case, I'm putting on an exposed fastener roof, and so it becomes really important just aesthetically that the fasteners are at the same level. And that kind of forces me to either use plywood uh, or to, to use horizontal battens.
So that leaves option four, right? So option four cross battens has the benefits of the uh, vertical battens in terms of airflow, like lots of airflow through this roof, lots of ability to dry out. Hopefully they'll keep rust and rot down. Um, and then all of the benefits from uh, having a good horizontal batten to fasten the roof into. So that just seemed perfect. And I guess the reason you don't normally do it is that it's more work and it's more uh, uh, timber, right? So it's a more expensive way to do it. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's more, more time consuming, more expensive, except in this particular case, because the roof is so steep, it basically creates a ladder work across the whole roof. And so my, so I went with this option with the hope that, that this would basically work as a giant ladder over the whole roof and that that would really help uh, when I was installing uh, the steel roof. And that totally turned out to be true. And the final layer then is this exposed fastener steel roof. I kind of just have two things to say about steel roofing. Uh, the first of which is that if you haven't done it before, this was the first one I ever put in. Um, our, our buildings is just a fantastic channel and there's so much material. Uh, so just watch all of his videos. The second thing is kind of sad, but basically everybody that I talked to that does steel roofing professionally was like the way you do it is you bring, you bring a big crew together. Uh, that way it's easy to move the panels around, get stuff up quickly. And so the plan had been to bring a bunch of friends and family down here for uh, a week's worth of camping and uh, barbecuing and putting a roof on. Uh, but, and you know, if you're watching this in the future, this is filmed in the middle of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and so we had to call that off and of course this, the roof still needs to get on the building is going to get damaged if we don't and so I Tried to approaching it solo and it it turns out that that worked it It wasn't awesome, but it was definitely possible and it certainly wasn't the hardest thing I've done on the cabin um, Yeah, I think just wearing a harness and going slowly and thinking about it. It, it worked. It was fine. That is the roofing assembly. So before we wrap up, let's mention something really briefly about how moisture moves through this wall. So what I'm finding is that a lot of these wall assemblies that I looked at, I'm like, oh, that's really smart. Um, this seems really energy efficient. Those assemblies are often designed for really cold climates where you have a lot of heating cost and a lot of energy output to keep a building at a, a you know, at a, a human friendly temperature. So those wall assemblies will be designed for, okay, well, on the inside of the building, in general, it's going to be warmer than the outside and it's going to be kind of humid, right? Here in Missouri, you have that same situation in the winter. The winter, it'll be uh, warm and humid on the inside, cold and dry on the outside. But in the summer, that relationship reverses. So in the summer, it's way warmer and way more humid on the outside than on the air conditioned space in the inside. So just taking an energy efficient wall assembly, which is kind of the stuff I looked at in the beginning, turns out that that doesn't work. So you need to think about what are the moisture properties of my region, like how, you know, how humid does it get in the summer, how humid is it in the winter, and so on and so forth, and find a wall assembly that works for your climate. So we just walked through how this wall assembly is put together. So let's talk through how it behaves in summer and winter in Missouri. Right now it's summer, so let's start with that. So this hot and humid air is going to try to move through the insulation, and as it does, it's going to move closer and closer to the temperature of the inside, right? The closer it gets to uh, the tongue and groove deck, the, the colder it's gonna get, because the inside air is colder. So as it moves through, in some areas, if the air moves quickly, you may actually get condensation. But both the insulation and the, um, the, the membrane that's on top of the uh, tongue and groove are totally fine with moisture, so 
basically as moisture moves in that direction there's nothing that's going to rot or get damaged if that moisture is trapped there any moisture that that does make it through those layers and reaches the tongue and groove um, then you have this really nice feature where all of the structural stuff and all of the wood is exposed to the inside so it's able to dry out through the inside the ac is basically ultimately pulling moisture through the tongue and groove and making sure that the wood stays dry so let's talk through the winter scenario in that case it'll be warm and quite humid in here relative to the outside and so that heat and humidity is going to want to move the other direction right uh, because we have all this insulation on the outside of the tongue and groove the tongue and groove is going to mostly be the same temperature as the inside so you're not going to have a cold surface that that hot and humid air causes condensation on and then you have the tarco membrane stopping most of the hot humid air keeping it on the inside any air that makes its way through the tarco membrane through a crack or crevice is then basically in the eps uh, or in the in the rigid foam insulation where basically the moisture doesn't really make a huge difference so the basic idea on, in the winter is that most of the air will be kept inside by the membrane uh, and nothing on this side of the membrane uh, is cold enough for it to uh, condensate on so that's kind of the rationale for this roof assembly and why it should work well in the Missouri climate where you have the moisture gradient shift back and forth across the year. That was probably one of the longest videos I've ever made. If there's anything else you'd like to see a video on, something else you're interested in about the cabin or seeing footage of, really anything, leave a comment. I read all the comments. Uh, it makes me super happy that there's so many people that get as excited about this stuff as, as I get. That is our show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I'll see you in the comments section.